Good morning. Let's talk a little bit about the economy, what's been going on. You've seen these speed dials before. These are the 20 leading economic indicators that we track on a monthly basis. There's a lot of research behind these, but it's nice to just present this in an overall summary so you get a feel of what's going on. This was back in January. Remember, green is good. It's moving in the right trend. Yellow means it's not moving in either direction. Red means it's bad. So as you can see, things were not necessarily looking good. International economics weren't doing good at all. The economic outlook over in Europe and Asia wasn't looking good. Equity market valuations wasn't looking good. Reason was the markets have been going up, right? The higher the market goes, the less value is out there, right? It's been appreciating, and it depreciated a little bit faster, I think, than most people expected. Okay, we're not complaining because our accounts are up and this and that, but we believe that the market's a little overpriced right now. Okay, so that's basically what's, what that is signaling. And geopolitical risk, that isn't going away, right? Russia, Ukraine, China, Israel, Hamas, and we've got a lot of stuff going on in the world, and we don't know you know, how that's going to impact us in the future. Let's fast forward to today, July. The picture's changed quite a bit. As you can see, consumer sentiment, that's how people feel about the economy, has actually improved quite a bit. The University of Michigan does this study for us, and they're the ones that report you know, monthly on how they do the studies and get how people feel about the economy. So people have been feeling better about the economy since they were at the beginning of the year, okay? The labor market actually has improved a little bit. Why? Because it's not as overheated as it was. I mean, there was a time there was nine jobs for every applicant. It's hard to believe. I know. But that has slowed down and balanced out a little bit. The housing market has improved a little bit, okay? It was kind of crazy. Like, I've heard stories of people offering $50,000, $100,000 over asking price because there weren't enough homes out there and not, a, you know, inventory. the inventory was so low that it was getting crazy and it was driving prices crazy. Well, that settled down. Plus, the all, other side of this is people that finance homes. Interest rates have been going up for the last year. They've leveled off and been staying level, so that kind of helps people plan and say, okay, maybe I'm not worried about the interest rates going up another point or two going out shopping for a home. So that's why it's in the positive category. Consumer spending has stayed strong. Why has that stayed strong? Because the labor market's strong. If people are working, they have money to spend, even though the economy and in general is slowing, which it is, consumers are still spending and our GDP is about 75 to 77% based off of consumer spending. The growth of the economy is very consumer oriented, okay? Another thing that moved positive is corporate profit growth and I'm gonna, I got a slide on this I'm gonna show you in a minute to talk about corporate profits last year versus this year and what we're expecting next year. Economic uh, International has improved, okay? And I'm gonna show a slide on that a little bit. Inflation, inflation is down. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. And credit demand and availability for companies to be able to borrow and produce new products and services has improved. So there's a lot of things that have improved in the last six months. Let's go into a little bit more detail of, of what specifically has changed. The biggest thing, the biggest concern two years ago was inflation. When you look at the left side of this, we're looking at the United States, the Eurozone, the United Kingdom, and Japan. Look at the all-time highs of inflation and when it happened. The United States, inflation peaked in June of 2022 at 9.1%. In the Eurozone, it happened in October, it went over 10%. 10.6% was their highest inflation peak. In the United Kingdom, it went over 11%. So even though we knew it was bad here, it was actually worse overseas, and that's why the international outlook looked worse than the United States, 
right? Now we can see basically where we're at here. At the end of April, the United States was running about 3.4. Actually, it's down to 3.3 now. But 3.4, the Eurozone dropped from 10 down to 2.5, wow. 2.4. And the United Kingdom from 11 down to 2. Now when we look at this side of the chart, this is the rate cut plan, we believe, for the Feds coming up. The Feds raised the interest rates up here to five and a quarter to five and a half percent. The actual effective rate that is going on right now is 5.33. That's the Fed's effective funds, overnight funds rate. That's why mortgages are still up seven, eight percent, right? Things like that, car loans, everything's up compared to what it was just a few years ago. But we believe that the Fed's gonna start making cuts and the first may come as soon as this September. We believe that there's gonna be one to three rate cuts this year, and that would be a good signal, again, for the stock market, that companies would be able to go out and borrow cheaper, consumers will be able to go out and afford cars and, and homes and things cheaper than they can today. So we're kind of looking at rates coming down over the next couple years, starting towards the end of this year. When we look at the actual growth of economies, this chart is kind of interesting because it represents, these dots represent two things. First, the size of the dot represents the size of the economy of that country relative to everybody else. So you can see the United States, the Eurozone, and China are the largest economies in the world. The higher up you are, the more you are growing, the faster you are growing, the lower you are, the less you are growing. Okay, and you've heard us talk for a while that we've been staying invested primarily in the U.S., right? Not investing much in overseas, and this is why, because they're still lagging. Their, their economic growth is lagging the United States. However, Europe has been coming up, so that's something we're keeping an eye on. But I think it's really interesting to see that even though our economy is slowing, we're still one of the fastest growing economies in the world. And I wanted to go into a little bit more detail. I thought this chart was really interesting because one of the things you don't hear, yeah, I'll explain it in a second. One of the things you don't hear on the news, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, have you heard about the manufacturing rebirth in the United States? What's going on? Is it publicized all over the, the news? Not really. They're not really talking about this. But really what's going on is these dots represent different types of manufacturing and infrastructure planning that is going on and starting to build new factories, new uh, research centers, things like that. And the dot colors represent the type of industry that it is in. So semiconductors, how many remember the CHIPS Act? Yeah. The concern that China's gonna take over Taiwan, we won't be able to get any semiconductors anymore because they all come from overseas, right? And that would shut us down. You can't, you can't buy a washing machine today without a, a chip in it, computer chip, right? So that's integral, and one of the good things our government did is said we're gonna fund, with the CHIPS Act, the development of factories in semiconductors. And everywhere you see orange dots are either the plans or have already started research, development, and manufacturing capacity for semiconductors. Clean energy manufacturing, these purple dots happening all over. The batteries, the EV battery plants. Biomanufacturing, heavy industry, that's what we're used to. Automotive, right? We're starting to rebuild some of that manufacturing and resource it back in the United States. Now looking at that, there's a lot of activity going on that we believe is gonna be very bullish for our economy and our markets moving forward over the next couple years. Let's go over some of the basic numbers. GDP, that's gross domestic product growth. If you look back at growth for the economy was about 2.5% in 2023. That's pretty close to the average for our country. 25 maybe a little bit higher. What we're estimating, again, for this year, it's gonna slow. But what we were talking about last year was a concern about an actual recession. A recession would mean these numbers could be negative. The, the economy would actually contract. That's when you're hearing of massive layoffs, 
And we've all experienced that, right, being around Detroit. We've seen when the big three announced 10,000, 20,000, this and that, okay? We don't believe that's happening this time. So it's gonna slow into this range in here. I think we're gonna be at the higher end of this range. Okay, I think we're gonna come in a higher than 2% for the growth this year, which is good growth. And we believe it's gonna stabilize and be in that range next year. So no negative growth, which is huge, because that was the concern coming out of 2022 into 2023, that our economy was actually going to go into a recession. We might have avoided that. Things are looking pretty positive right now, so we like that. This is the real interesting thing and one of the things that's driving the market. Look at corporate profit in 2023. That's nothing. The historic average for the last 50 years, averaging out growth of corporations and profits is over 10%. Yeah, but look what we're forecasting for this year. Somewhere between nine and 12. Again, I think there's gonna be above 10%. CPI is the Consumer Price Index. These two measure inflation. In 2023, the top line inflation rate was 3.3. The underlying core was 3.9. It is slowing. The Fed increasing interest rates have slowed the economy down because we are driven by debt. Companies borrow to fund new development. All that is slowing down, but we need it to because it was out of control, right? 9% is not sustainable, okay? So here you can see we're expecting inflation to come under last year and to continue into next year. That also is very bullish for the stock market. And then down here, the Fed's fund rate last year was there. It stayed, it stayed level through this year, but we believe it's going to come down from this range. I said if the effective one is about 5.33%, we expect that to come down to maybe even under 5% this year. But we see a lot of strength through the markets, through both the equity markets, through profitability, and the bond market, through stabilized uh, interest rates that can pay higher than the inflation rate. All right, let's talk about the markets. Um, we'll start with the asset classes. It really give, kind of gives you an overview of where we are year to date in the markets. And we've got it set up here on this chart with global equities, commodities, global 60-40 portfolio, which is your average portfolio, 60% equities, 40% bonds. REITs, and then global bonds. And you can see from a global equity standpoint, uh, not a bad year so far. But you can also see if the green is the second quarter and the blue is the year to date, that the year to date is much higher than let's say last quarter, which tells you what? Says that the first quarter was a pretty strong quarter and it kind of slowed down in the second quarter. But all in all, uh, so far year to date doing quite well. And think about it from a global equity standpoint, we're talking about global companies. And a lot of what's pushing the global companies right now is the US. Uh, it's kind of holding things up a little bit or from the rest of the world. Commodities, pretty much a steady eddy this year. Commodities are difficult to trade on. Um, that's why we don't really have commodities in the portfolio, they're kind of like well, they're commodities. They, they kind of do their own thing. And a lot less predictable for a long-term portfolio. Uh, I'm going to skip over the global, go to REITs. Everybody knows what REITs are. They're real estate investment trusts. Kind of think of it like a mutual fund with a bunch of properties in it. That's what a REIT is. But REITs tend to be non-liquid. You know, you get into them and the REIT company tells you when you can get out. And it's not something we really like all that well. Um, generally, because if the market's not doing something, we can make adjustments to get the returns out of it. But with a REIT, you just got to set it and forget it type thing. And that could be good or bad. And then global bonds. Global bonds, um, <clears throat> I think everybody's heard me talk about the fact that we're currently in a secular bear market for bonds. Now again, what is a secular market? Secular markets tend to last 
a decade, two decades, three decades, four decades, depending on which, uh, whether you're talking about equities or bonds. Um, the last, the last, um, well, the last two secular bear markets or secular markets for bonds lasted 30 and 35 years. So it is conceivable that we will be in a secular bear market for bonds really going on another 20, 25 years, um, which really kind of hurts the conservative investor, doesn't it? Yes. Because that's where most conservative people go. They'll go to bonds to kind of stabilize their portfolio. And that brings me back to the global 60-40 portfolio. Um, if you look at the difference between the global equities and the returns on the global 60-40, you'll see there's a pretty big difference there, and it's all driven on the downside because of the, the bond markets right now. And again, going back to the secular markets, a secular market effectively will have bulls and bears in it, but it generally a bear market just rides sideways. Think about, think about the <clears throat> secular equities uh, market in, um, say, from 2000 to 2015. It was just a big W. You know, it came down, went up, same, same price, came back down, came back up to the same price. So effectively, 15 years, the equity market just walked sideways. Um, doesn't mean you can't make money in it. Now, if you were a passive investor, yeah, you would have went down with the market, up with the market, down with the market, up with the market. But because we are tactical investors, we didn't go down as far. We came back up further. We didn't go down as far. We came, so we actually went up on an upward bias for the clients in our firm. Um, and that's, that's the, the benefit of a tactical nature of, of portfolios. So you can see that when, when you think about it from a conservative standpoint, if, if you effectively want dividends, let's say, I mean, mo a lot of people get bonds because they want dividends, they want the income that comes out of it. Uh, two things I would say there. Number one, make sure that the dividend portfolio is in a qualified account, not non-qualified. The major reason is the tax structure, the, the way dividends get taxed and the way capital gains get taxed, the capital gains is much lower from a tax standpoint. So we try to stay away from dividend portfolios within a non-qualified account. It's not tax, it's not a good tax move effectively. But if you have them in an IRA or a Roth IRA, doesn't really matter. It's either going to be fully taxable or it's going to be fully tax free. But the one thing I want you to understand when it comes to the bond market, if we are in a secular bear market, which we are, um, effectively you'll have a year where you're looking pretty good and then it's kind of retraced and then it comes back up again and it retraces. Um, kind of think of 2022. 2022, the bond market was down, right? 2023, the bond market was up. 2024, what's happening? Bond market's down again. So you're effectively walking sideways, and yes, you're collecting the dividends, and by the end, when you sell off, when that bond matures, you're gonna get that full par value of the bond, um, plus whatever dividends that you accrued along the way. But what you would expect is that your portfolio will not perform as well in a traditional 60-40 portfolio. Um, although those portfolios did do very well in 2023, but again, what did the bonds do? They were up that year, um, not so much this year. So that's the global aspect of it. Now, when you think about the, the stock market, there's two, two areas that we look at when we're trying to project out where is the market going. And we look at the economic and financial, the fundamentals of what's going on with the economy and the different companies. And right now, that's not looking bad at all. Uh, and then on the other side of the track, we've got the technicals. What do the technicals say about the market? What do the graphs say? What do the charts say? What, where's the, the market going? And when it comes to the technical side, we're looking really at a shorter window 
you know, really a three to six months out to see where, where the market is going based on different trends that are happening. Um, the good news is by the end of the year, both of them are pretty much saying the same thing. We're going to have a decent end of the year. But on the technical side, you know, when you think about the economic cycle, so you've got the expansion, then you hit the peak, and then you have a contraction, and then you're in a trough. That's your economic cycle. Right now, from an economic cycle, we're kind of towards the bottom, towards the trough, getting ready to take off again. Um, although this is really a weird cycle when you think back about everything that's going on over the last three years. The stock market, on the other hand, even though it goes through a same cycle, it doesn't, the pattern doesn't stay, stay in the same time frame. Um, and a matter of fact, when you think about it, stock markets generally hit the bottom about six months before the economic cycle is. And as Rocky alluded to, the chance of a recession and hitting that bottom is getting less and less and less. Um, so we're looking, at, we're looking at the technicals from that standpoint. We, we do still think we've got a dip coming in the market. And he's, Rocky's got a chart that'll show later on that shows you the average four-year cycle of what happens to the stock market. And it, it takes all the different presidents all the way back to the 1900s in the stock market and averages it all out. So you can kind of get a feel of what the market does on average. But one thing it does show you is that there's a dip before the presidential cycle uh, more often than not. And we, we are expecting that to happen still. Um, recession soft landings are still projected for the third and fourth quarter. Will it happen? You know, it's, they keep pushing things out. I mean, uh, so we'll see how that plays out. <clears throat> Um, I've talked before about significant gaps in the market right now. And a gap, again, is nothing more than, let's say you have an index that's, that closed at 100. There's always overnight trading going on. You guys can't do it, but there's a lot of people that are doing it. Uh, and that influences what the open is going to be the next morning. So if it's really good news, and let's say the, op the market opened up 5% higher, you know, you've got a gap right there. Where did it close? Where did it open up? And that gap is what we're looking at in the market. And the gaps are, there's two significant gaps in the S&P 500, the Russell 2000, the Russell 3000, and um, the Russell 1000 as well. So you've got gaps in the pretty much the aggregate market. And it happened on the S&P around 42.49. That was the actual low. So that's a pretty significant drop from where we are right now. <clears throat> now, gaps tend to get filled within, I mean, they can get, get filled within that day. They could get filled a day later, a week later, a month later, two months later. This one's long in the tooth because it's actually going back all the way to October of 2023. I've never seen it go that long without filling the gap. So now the question is, is it actually going to do it or not? But we do think there's going to be a dip in the market. Whether it goes down that far or not, we're not sure. And I'll, I'll show you some charts that kind of talk about what we're seeing right now. One thing we do know is that if things look a little dicey out there because the market is overvaluated, you will see people taking their profits, and that sometimes spurs a healthy correction. Now, most people would look at the market and say, well, if it goes down 20%, that doesn't sound too healthy, right? So how many people in here lift weights? All of you. That's great. All of you do. Uh, you know, when you're lifting weights, what happens? When you, when you start lifting, you're breaking down the muscles, right? <laughs> well, you try not to fall down, but you break down the muscles and you break down the muscles to build them back stronger, right? Well, that's effectively what a healthy correction in the market is. They generally only last about a quarter, so it's a, it's a very short season. And it's actually an opportunity for us to recalibrate the portfolio to allow it to come out faster and higher than it would have been if it just would have kept going the way it was. 
Uh, so this is something we don't have a problem with at all. Matter of fact, I kind of look forward to these little dips in the market. It's also a great time to do Roth conversions because if the market goes down 20%, well, effectively, you've shrunk your IRA money, which is all taxable, right? You convert some of it, it goes back up all tax-free. That seems to be a win for me. Uh, so any kind of Roth conversions that can be done during a dip really does make a lot of sense. And you, you just ask Kim, anytime there's a dip in the market, what is she doing? She's doing a lot of Roth conversions for clients at that point. So going back to the chart, this chart at the beginning of the year was really running to this point. And when you're reading this chart, you've got the S&P 500 capital weighted on the left side. And again, capital weighted effectively means that based on the size of the company that's in that index, it determines the share of returns you're going to get. The, so think of Apple. Apple's one of the biggest companies out there, right? The a Apple is in the S&P 500, and it's, it takes up about 7 7 7.5% of the returns. You've also got a company called News Corp, which is the smallest company in the S&P, which is just getting a fraction, based on their returns, uh, of influence on the returns on the index. So what does that mean? It means that if the tech stocks are doing really well, which they are, and the S&P has a lot of tech stocks in there, is it going to influence the S&P more so today than it did, let's say, 10 years ago? Well, the answer is yes. Matter of fact, if I put up a chart of the NASDAQ 100, which is nothing but tech stocks, it would look very similar to the S&P capital weighted. Now, you flip over to this chart, and you can see a totally different story here, right? It's still the S&P 500. The difference is, again, it's equal weighted, which means the, the Apple stock gets a 2% share, and so does News Corp relative to their returns. Uh, what this shows me is a little bit better understanding of what the broader market is doing. And if you look at 2023, you know, this thing just went basically sideways all year. But if you looked at it on that chart, you'd think, oh, shoot, everything is, it, it's like coming up roses, right? Because it just kept going up. They both had dips, but at the end of the day, it was, it was more of a, an upward, way more of an upward bias than this W that's going on again. Now you get into this year, and we started getting a bit of a correction here in May. And I'm sure you all remember it listening to the news. Um, and there's something in a technical that, that basically says this. It's a basic rule. If the stock market goes up to a high, comes down, and then goes back up and doesn't reach the high, it tends to continue to go down never happened over here because it kept going to new highs on the capital weighted. Why? Because the tech stocks were still driving the S&P 500, and they are today. Now, if I looked at this chart today, you know, this is now eight or nine, 10 days later, where do you think the overall market went over that time frame? Went up. So it kind of broke that downward trend. We thought that, okay, maybe we're starting at this point. Still remains to be seen. I do know this. Yesterday was kind of a wonky day in the market where the market was up 1% and it ended up down about 1%. So we had a 2% swing in it. Uh, but it's starting to come right back down. I think we're down like 4% from the last high we just had. Uh, so it's, it's what, what I see when we're looking at this is a lot of what we saw in October of 2021, yeah, 2021. We still ended up with a decent return at the end of the year. Uh, but at that point, we started, we, you could see the cracks of everything starting to roll over. And I'm seeing that right now. But again, I'm not talking about a 50% correction. I'm talking about a more of a healthy correction. Could be 10%. If we go down to these levels here, uh, we're looking at about 19%, which again still qualifies as a healthy correction. 
The bond market. We looked at the global bond market. The global bond market is down. This is um, AGG. It's, a, it's an index that effectively is the aggregate bond fund for the US. So this is US only. And you can see 2023, it was up a bit. But in 2024, again, the US bonds are down. So just expect, if you're in bonds, a lot of bonds, you're, it's a sideways walk, really. But if you're in it for the dividends, then it's okay, because that's the dividends are what you're looking for. One of the things that occurred in 2023 is because the interest rates had gone up so high, your money market started making money again. Remember back in 2000? Anybody can remember back in 2000? If you got into a GMAC demand note, you were making like 7% with virtually no risk. Well, we haven't seen that in decades. Uh, but these are pretty good numbers that we're seeing that ended up in 2023. And it looks like we're going to be at about 5% by the end of the year. Now, when you're looking at the broader market, large cap, mid cap, small cap, tech stocks, world markets, if you look at 2023, we all probably looked at our portfolios and said, you know what? Got it back. Good year. Because almost everywhere you were investing was making money at that point. And it makes sense because when you hit the bottom of the market, where does most of your return come in the next six months? Comes in the next six months. It's like 60% of the returns, the bounce back comes in that first six months. And that really kind of propelled 2023. But 2024 is given a little bit of a different story. You can see we're on that downside of the bond market here. Your emerging markets, your all country, that's not doing so bad. I mean, if you think about it, this is halfway through the year. Um, the NASDAQ stocks up 19% already. And again, keep this in mind, because when you're looking at the, the returns of these two here, that's the 100, uh, Russell 100 growth large cap, the S&P 500 large cap, they are heavily influenced by the NASDAQ stocks that are actually in there. You can see why certain areas are really outperforming others in the market. And again, the S&P 500 equal weighted just about year to date. This is what the broader market is actually doing from large caps. It's not this. This is just heavily driven by this number right here with the NASDAQ. Uh, now, does that mean we don't have tech stocks in our portfolios? Absolutely we do. Do we have them weighted the same way as these indexes? Absolutely not, because what goes up really fast usually go, does what? Drops down. Goes down real fast. And who wants to be on a roller coaster, right? We'd rather be like this. You know, just keep that, that steady movement up. So all in all, I think we're gonna have a pretty decent year by the end of the year. We'll probably be up somewhere in this range even if we have that dip and then run up to the election. We're just kind of kind of go over some of the basic points we want to make, what we see moving forward as potential headwinds. Inflation has been stubborn, okay? It's not down to where the Fed wants it at 2.5%. Like I said, we're at about 3.3. Can we get there? I don't know, in all honesty, but the good news is we've come way down from the 9% we had two years ago. Consumer spending finally is starting to slow. Debt is rising. However, it's not out of historical norms, okay? The one thing, one of the reasons that spending has been so good, if you guys remember back to COVID, what started coming in the mail to people? Checks, $1,200 here. $1,200 there. Most people didn't need those checks. They kind of stuck them away for a while, but then when they could get out and start spending it again, boy, did our spending take off, right? Well, that money's gone. Okay, we've seen this, the research on it. All that discretionary excess income and uh, savings has pretty much been eliminated now from the US consumer. So we're starting now to see the effects of now you gotta live on what you're actually making and it's slowing the economy down. Elections, 
I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But understand that long term, when the economy is strong, the election is only a short term issue that we deal with. Things tend to settle down after the election. And if the economy is strong, it continues to move forward. <clears throat> Geopolitical risks are not going away. Okay, and, and we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> so that's going to be out there. But those are the basic headwinds. The good news is there's a lot of good things that are happening. The probability of a soft landing versus an actual recession is increased. At the end of 2022, this number was about 25%. Probability of slow growth versus a recession. It's all the way gone up to 60% chance of just slow but growing and not negative. We do expect the Fed to start lowering interest rates. There's a lot of pent up demand out there. I've talked with a lot of 40 year olds that are looking to get into their second home. And guess what? Even if they can afford it because they got a good job, they're not doing it because they're looking at it going, I've got a 3% mortgage on my $300,000 house. I want to buy a $600,000 house at 7%. I can't do that. So they don't sell. So the inventory stays low, which keeps the prices high because there's less inventory. All this is going on. If those rates start coming down to where the people that are looking to move can start saying, OK, it's not going to double my payment to go to that next home they may be more willing to do that. So we need those rates to come down. The labor market is strong, OK? Our current unemployment is 4.1%. You know what the 50-year historical average is? The 50-year historical unemployment figure for the United States is 5.69. So we have very low unemployment. The rebuilding of the manufacturing capacity and infrastructure that's going on, OK? As a result, we believe that other investment spending will kick in. Other companies that are not traditionally tied to manufacturing and infrastructure that got help through the CHIPS Act and the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, where money is getting pumped into those things, the other companies will start seeing, hey, the economy's solid, there's growth, there's people able to spend money, and they'll start uh, borrowing and spending also. So. See, I had this slide already for you guys right? that said, yeah, but what about the elections? We told you all this good stuff, right? Well, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but I'm going to tell you historically what tends to happen regardless of who's in office. And this has actually played out so far, this uh, presidential cycle. You look at the first year the election year of a cycle. And this is what Dan was talking about. The market tends to kind of be going up, but then there's a correction. But then going right into the election cycle, it starts to pick up, up to election day. Always after, there's a little bit of a pullback, OK? But if the economy's strong, coming out of the election, going into the first year of the new presidency, we tend to have a pretty good year. OK? In the second year, we tend to have a pretty good downturn. And the reason this happens, what happens in the second year? Midterm. Yep, midterm elections. That actually is probably, from a fiscal point of view, more important than the president election. Because the House, Congress can change dramatically in that year. So look at that year. Look at the volatility. There's a lot of concern going into that election, because that's more likely the one to impact long-term taxes and things like that. But after we come out of that election cycle, look what ends up happening. This is the third year. What was last year? 2023 was the third year. And to look at it a little different, doesn't matter what color you are. You know, historically, when you look at the markets, they tend to grow whether we have a Democratic or Republican presidency. 
And I know the easiest thing to say is, well, this time it's different, but we could have said that many times in history, right? So there's always something new. The stock market has done fairly well. And that's what this shows us, that it doesn't matter who's in the White House, we can figure out a way to make money if we stay invested. All right, let's look at the wrap up here, which effectively, we're just gonna recap everything we just said uh, in a short version. Expect US equities, and we've been saying this for a long time, right? Expect the US equities to do better than the non-US equities in the overall portfolios. Forecasting positive but moderate returns for the S&P 500. And what we're talking about here is really the equal weighted. Because uh, if you just look at the capital weighted right now, that doesn't look like moderate returns, does it? That, that's, they're like out of control. In, in a good way. Um, look for an increase in mid small cap equities in the portfolio. So you probably have already seen that there's been some changes in the portfolios, a little bit more away from some of the large cap stocks and a sprinkling into mid cap and small cap stocks. And the reason for that, especially if we get this dip, is the blend portfolios will not go down as fast as just the large caps do, and they will actually come back out a little bit faster than the large caps in general. Unless your portfolio is all technology, and then it's anybody's guess how far it'll go up. Uh, investment grade corporate bonds and municipals offer attractive yields. Now again, remember what I said before, uh, there's two components to the, the growth of a bond. One is the just pure growth of the, the bond itself. In other words, it started out at 100 and went to 105. And then there's the yield that goes along with it. And the yield and the, the growth in, in a bond have inverse relations. So the further the bond goes up in value, the lower the yield goes because it's a percentage the, the amount you get is a percentage of the whole. Um, so when, when it, it's kind of funny, I, I, I giggle every time. Giggle, is that right? Is, should I be giggling? Uh, well, I do. Uh, I, I listen to the guys on the news saying, oh, the bond yields are up. And I'm like, okay, that just meant the bonds are down. Why didn't you just say that? But that's not, that's not the way, that doesn't sound as good. Um, high yield corporates, are still good. Um, you are actually getting a better return, but there is more volatility relative to them. All right, actions for us. Basically, we're gonna continue to keep you informed. I mean, education is probably the biggest, probably the backbone of what we do with our clients. We just feel that the more educated you are, the better decisions you can make. And then we'll stay on top of the changes in the market environment, because effectively, we're gonna have to make some prudent adjustments as we go along and being tactical managers, that's what we do. So, don't you guys worry, we'll take care of you. We're ready for the future and beyond.